So there's been a lot of success lately in the development of targeted therapy drug development, and we're at this meeting today discussing immunotherapeutic development. So we think maybe in the future going forward, we could use immunotherapy to try to get the host or the person to respond to the tumors, and at the same time give drugs that are very specific to go after the cancer. So doesn't that sound great? It seems like the best of all worlds, right? Well, it hasn't been quite that simple, and I'm gonna use melanoma as a, um, I guess I said an archetypal example. I was feeling good when I wrote this, huh? So in melanoma, this is a really, really important signaling pathway. So when the melanoma grows, it sends signals down through this, these proteins, to grow further. And as the patients who have melanoma will know, about half of patients with melanoma have a mutation in a gene called BRAF, most commonly BRAF V600E. And the dr first drug development to go after that was a drug called Vemurafenib, which is a pill that you can take that works quite well. Here's the waterfall plot. These are all individual patients showing how much their cancer shrunk when they took Vemurafenib. And you can see that some of them, it went away entirely. And there's a gradient here in terms of how much response there was. Now, unfortunately, the median progression-free survival, how long this works, is on average about six months, six to seven months. And even with next generation approaches, it's about 10 months. So that's somewhat in contrast to the immunotherapeutic approaches that we saw earlier, where the response rates maybe aren't quite as high, but you have the potential to induce a long-term response. So wouldn't it be great? Give the drug, shrink it, give immunotherapy, lengthen it. So what happened, oh, there's further uh, rationale for giving these two drugs as, together as well. We noticed in patients who got Vemurafenib at first, if you did a biopsy of their tumor, soon after they started on the BRAF inhibitor, we actually saw that immune cells trapped into the tumor. So blocking the BRAF gene with the targeted therapy seemed to make the immune cells notice the cancer more. That's shown here, where you can see that uh, CD8 cells are those T cells we keep talking about. And here, you don't have a lot of them. You start the BRAF inhibitor, all this brown are the immune cells that trafficked in there. We also know that when in cell line models in the laboratory, if you induce the cells to be resistant to the BRAF inhibitor, you actually get upregulation of PDL1. So there's definitely crosstalk between these pathways that we target with targeted therapies and these immunotherapeutic approaches for cancer. So again, it seems like a no-brainer that we would combine these. Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. So the first phase one trial that tried to combine ipilimumab with vemurafenib had to be closed because the patients developed liver toxicity. And this is the, from the um, report in the New England, Medical, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, essentially outlining that patients' liver enzymes went up quite high pretty fast after getting the two drugs together. So was this an ipilimumab problem? Was this a BRAF inhibitor problem? Well, we're not really sure. There's been a further trial done combining dabrafenib and trametinib and ipilimumab. And for those with, no, with melanoma, this is the standard BRAF approach now. But this trial had to be closed for colonic perforations. In other words, it seemed worsened ipilimumab toxicity. So again, is this an ipilimumab problem or a kinase inhibitor problem? We're not sure. It is of interest that dabrafenib plus trametinib does appear to be somewhat safer. Uh, these were the toxicities that patients experienced. And uh, unfortunately, two patients who got the combination had development of holes in their colon from ipilimumab. So we commonly don't combine these two treatments together at this time, and we're not clear on how to use them. Um, in kidney cancer, there's been a somewhat similar experience. So there was a phase one trial done of sinitinib, the VEGFR inhibitor, with tremilimumab, which is a sort of a sister molecule to ipilimumab. This is the toxicity profile that was described in that clinical trial, and I won't go through it all except to say that this is bad. These are all toxicities. And what was found was that um, in the patient's kidneys, there was immune infiltration that caused kidney damage. And it's not clear why, but giving these targeted kinase inhibitors seemed to somehow agitate or irritate the response of the immunotherapy. So again, ipilimumab problem, sunitin problem, we're not sure. So trying to tease this out is a big interest of ours in the medical research field now, because perhaps you can't give them together and you gotta give them in sequence. So we've gone forward, and this is a clinical trial that I developed through the National Cancer Institute, and I'm just highlighting it for the sake of the, the schema. And you can see here, we're giving people dabrafenib, trametinib, or trametinib, or dabrafenib, or no, no, no treatment, and then giving everybody IPI, and then seeing how this goes. So perhaps you have to give them in sequence in different orders instead of giving them at the same time. What about PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies? Well, we know that they're less toxic. So is it possible that you could give them more easily in combination with other drug treatments? Uh, we know that this PD-L1 expression is influenced by these oncogenes, such as BRAF and EGFR. So there are a lot of ongoing clinical trials to try to sort this out. And I put this table to highlight just the fact that we see multiple myeloma, melanoma, renal cell, non-small cell lung cancer, all kinds of different tumors. We're trying to combine these different therapies. We just don't know the best way to do it yet. 
What about chemotherapy? Someone asked a question and I answered it when I was sitting up here earlier. It's been described that some chemotherapies may induce immunological cell death. And so what does that mean? Well, it could influence the immune system in some sort of way. So some chemotherapies you may have heard of, like gemcitabine, oxaliplatin, cyclophosphamide, they may influence the maturation of certain immune cells, such as dendritic cells, and facilitate antigen presentation, so they're more likely to show the immune cells that they'll uh, be able to prime the cancer. Uh, there are other uh, treatments, such as cyclophosphamide, which seem to have specific treatment effect on some of these T regulatory cells, which are some of the normal cells in your body that actually dampen your immune response. So it's theoretically possible that these drugs could be used in combination or sequence with immunotherapies. Again, we're not entirely sure. Radiation is another area that's of interest. Uh, and this is from a famous page where, uh, published by Dr. Wolchuk's group, in which a patient got ipilimumab therapy and had disease here, here, here. And as they went through, it appeared that the therapy wasn't having the desired effect as the cancers were getting bigger. The patient went on to see radiation treatment to a back a spinal metastasis that was symptomatic. And thereafter, despite maintenance therapy, the tumor started to go away. So is it possible that radiation to that one site of disease somehow flipped things over so that the immune system was able to go further? And there's a lot of preclinical or laboratory data that suggests that radiation may be synergistic with immunotherapy. And this is, again, to highlight that this is an active area of research in the, in the field. This is only a sampling of all the clinical trials that are going on combining radiation with immunotherapy. This is actually just ipilimumab trials. The numbers are going off the charts for PD-1 trials as well. So in terms of combination therapies, uh, I think we're still very early in the development of these approaches. Um, the future is probably in combinations, although it's not entirely clear which is which. Um, you know, we could think about combining multiple inhibitory pathways, such as CTLA-4 and PD-1. You could think about combining uh, PD-1, CTLA-4 with uh, VEGF or blood vessel blockers. You could combine it with vaccines or other immune stimulants, with radiation, with chemotherapies, and finally with adoptive T-cell transfer or CAR T-cells, those cells I alluded to which have already been sort of designed to be able to go and find the cancer. So very quickly at the end, I'm just going to try to uh, discuss quickly. Someone asked a question about which uh, can we predict who is likely to benefit from treatment with immunotherapy. And I was a little um, I, I sort of hedged on you there. And I said, I, I don't really know. Well, I'm going to show you sort of some information that suggests that we know a little bit, but not enough yet to really tell us exactly what to do. Some of those areas are evaluating some of the other immune cells, such as the uh, absolute lymphocyte count looking in the tumor microenvironment to see if there are factors there that would suggest to us whether or not this is going to work, the pdl one status, and whether or not, just globally speaking, it looks like the tumor has been recognized or not. So these are data uh, from Sloan Kettering and then from a, 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 a joint effort that we had when I was at the Dana-Farber, looking at patients who were treated with ipilimumab. And it's quite clear that patients um, who have a higher absolute lymphocyte count after seven weeks of treatment appear to have a better outcome. This needs to be validated in larger data sets, uh, but it is of some interest. There are a number of factors in the tumor microenvironment that potentially uh, influence the activity. I'm not going to read all of these. I put them up there just to suggest to you that we're working on this. There are things that we can find. The problem is that these are easier and more difficult to actually look at. I'm going to highlight 2,3-dolamine uh, dioxygenase, which is an enzyme that can be secreted in the microenvironment. And suffice it to say, this is an important enzyme that uh, works on T cell uh, activity. Uh, and it's expressed in a number of different uh, tissues. A drug has been developed to try to block this enzyme that's called IDO. That drug is called Indoximode. And there was a clinical trial done of combining it with ipilimumab. And I'll just show here that this shows that this seems to make ipilimumab work better in combining it with this. So perhaps we can learn by looking in the tumor what other factors we could add in. What about the PD-1 status? You heard about this already. We'd heard earlier that PDL1. Uh, positivity co-localizes with immune cells that can get to the cancer but can't really figure out how to kill it. And I'll just highlight that in the trials so far, we've seen that patients who are PDL1 negative, so patients who don't have expression, expression can still have resist responses, meaning more than 30% tumor shrinkage. And that was from the Genentech antibody. This is from the Merck antibody, where I highlight that these are patients who have significant benefit from the drug where the biomarker is negative. So it's clearly not a good biomarker yet. Um, it is, however, predictive that it's more likely that you will benefit if it's present, but it shouldn't be used as a selection factor prior to treatment at this time. And finally, I'll just state that perhaps we need a more global profile of the tumor. 
we, you know, we've talked quite a bit about whether or not the tumor cell gets recognized. And if we see in the tumor that there are a lot of immune cells and all these other properties, it can suggest to us that this treatment might work. If they don't have this, perhaps that means we should try a different treatment. And we're working on ways to be able to identify that at this time. So in conclusion, at the current time, it's not clear exactly when the best time to give immunotherapy would be. And there are different um, uh, hypotheses as to why one might be better than another. This actually could be different between different types of immunotherapy, as well as the specific circumstances of the patient. Um, we're developing predictive factors of treatment success, so we call them biomarkers, and they'll be very important in helping to determine which treatment to get next. And finally, I just want to emphasize that despite all of this great uh, achievement and all these advances that we've talked about today, clinical trials are essential to better understand which approach is best for patients at which time in their treatment. Thank you very much.